How precise is this machine? Let's find out. Welcome to another episode. I've had this machine for close to two years, not quite two years, and one of the things that I've always wondered is just how precise and accurate is this machine. Today I'm going to find out. Now, one of the things I need to point out is that I'm going to be describing what I know and what I've learned, but check the comments below. There have been some really great comments from my viewers in the past, and I suspect there are going to be some really good comments from this video as well. So, you know, please check down below and see what other people say and uh, the additional information they provide. Let's get started and see how accurate the machine is and precise. The tool is currently in the last position it was in when I turned the machine off. And what I'm going to do now is press the power up restart or reset and you're going to see it move up to the home switch and then it's going to move down a little bit. So watch carefully. Okay, so inside the uh, machine is an encoder that uh, is used to track the position of the ball screw. Uh, this is an example of an encoder that might be attached to a, uh, a gear or a shaft or a pulley or something like that to be able to track motion. This is also an encoder. This one is typically, typically called uh, an rotary pulse generator or RPG, but it's an encoder. So if I turn this you can see that I'm getting signals. And I'm getting signals from two different channels, the, uh, the blue channel and the yellow channel, which are mapped into yellow and blue here. And so as I turn this, you can see we're getting pulses from both of those channels. And the shape of the pulses, or the order of the pulses, varies depending on whether you're going forward or reverse. This is using something known as a quadrature encoder. So the quadrature encoder can tell the direction you're moving as well as how fast you're moving and exactly what steps you're taking. The difference between this and what's in my Haas is the Haas has an additional channel. So whereas this has two channels, the Haas has a third channel which is called the Z channel. So what happens with a Z channel is that every once every rotation, like when this gets to zero, it fires another pulse. So again, every time around it fires another pulse. And what that means is that the machine can determine its position to exactly one pulse width. And that's what gives us the insane accuracy or repeatability that we're getting with the homing on the Haas. I did a quick search and found this rotary encoder that does have a Z channel. It doesn't say anything in the description. So I found it because there were some comments about this. If you look at the this right here, it tells you the part number and the data sheet, and it turns out that this Z right here is what says that this has a zero channel. So if we look at the data sheet, this is the particular one here, and uh, there are a couple things I want to point out. First of all, for clockwise versus counterclockwise, you can see the uh, the phase of the pulses are different. So here the top one comes first on the rising edge. Here the bottom one comes first on the rising edge. And this is how you can tell whether it's moving clockwise or counterclockwise. But in addition, once per 360 degrees of rotation, you also get this zero pulse uh, so that you can tell exactly what the position is. First it moves up until it hits the home switch, which can be either mechanical or electromagnetic. And then it reverses direction and turns until it hits the zero channel. One of the other questions with uh, accuracy is, is how rigid is the machine? So someone mentioned that I should be able, if I push and pull on the column, I should be able to get this to move and you can see I'm pushing, pulling pretty hard and pushing pretty hard. And it does move uh, plus or minus probably about a tenth of one ten thousandth of an inch or so, which is pretty good. Now if I do the same thing on the Y, you can see I can get a lot more movement. I'm uh, pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling on this. 
it is pretty rigid, but I can't expect it to be rigid uh, to less than uh, one ten thousandths of an inch. Getting to maybe uh, you know, three or four ten thousandths of an inch is, certainly seems to be achievable. The next thing I want to test is the impact on spindle, spindle orientation on the Heimer to see if it makes a difference as to what the orientation is. You can see on the holder, this particular holder has a little divot here. And if I press the orient spindle button, you can see it moves to a specific position and then stops. And uh, it's held in place pretty firmly. It does wiggle a little bit. And then if I press the reset button, now I can uh, spin it again. So I'm going to do some uh, experiments with the uh, Heimer to see how much of a difference the orientation makes to the repeatability. The first thing I'm going to do is make sure I have the spindle oriented again. And then I'm going to put the Heimer in. Now the first thing I'm going to do before I get too far into this is just mark things on here. So I'm going to put a little sharpie mark there on the spindle and there on the tool holder. Uh, I'm not sure you can see that very well, so let me make it a little clearer. So right there I've got uh, two sharpie marks so I can tell when I've got uh, the same alignment and I can see what the alignment is. So I'm going to bring this down and uh, then pick up the side of the part. And then bring this to zero, switching to one ten thousandths of an inch. All right, what I'm going to do at this point is um, press the, the memory and then hand jog so that the distance to go is zero on the screen. Now I can move back away. Then I'm going to move the uh, Z up a little bit. And I'll move it over a little bit so I can change it here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this out. And then I'm going to rotate this approximately 90 degrees so the mark is right there. And then I'll put this back in. And then uh, bring it back over. and see what I get on the screen. This is the uh, relevant number right here. And so you can see we're off by eight ten thousandths of an inch. So let me go back and uh, rotate it another 90 degrees so the mark is at the back instead of the front and see what happens to this number. Okay, so I'm going to take this out. And now uh, I'll show you, see there it was. And so what I'm going to do is put my finger on that and then move it to the back. This is obviously not precise, but it gives you an idea. And let's see how close we get this time. Now we're off by a full one thousandths of an inch. So I start by making sure that I'm moving at the smallest distance and then that the Heimer uh, moves in the correct direction. And once I do, I can move it by more distance until it's, it's far enough away. And then I can move it carefully even more of a distance away. And then I want to go up in Z. And at this point, I'm going to take the Heimer out and then press the Orient Spindle. And you can see the, this is now in the front again. And if I do tool release. Now at this point, um, I have not pressed the reset button. So you can see this is hunting a little bit. When I have the orient spindle on, it's, it's, you know, it's not perfect, but it will, if I push, put force on it, it will return it to the position. So at this point, I want to press the reset button so that it stops doing the jiggling and it's now free to move. And if I move that down, all 
All right, let's have a look at the screen and see how we did. And you can see we have repeatability to within two ten thousandths of an inch. So this shows you how important it is if I want to get really good repeatability that I make sure the, the spindle is oriented correctly uh, before I put the hymer in. So before inserting the hymer, uh, there's a new dance I want to follow, which is orient spindle. Oops, I need to be in hand jog. And then orient spindle and then reset. And then it's all good to go. And that'll ensure that when I put the hymer in, it's in exactly the same orientation each time. Next up is building a 2.5 inch by 2.5 inch test piece so I can check the dimensional accuracy. So this should be uh, 2.5 inches. And uh, let's see where it came out at. Okay, so 2.502 is what it's saying, but if I look here, uh, it's really, I can't trust this, this last digit. It's basically showing at uh, 2.501. So that means this is 1,000 thicker or wider uh, than it should be. So let's try this dimension. And this is pretty much right on. So it looks like it's um, at 0.9. So it's uh, basically one tenth under, if I'm reading this correctly. I'll do another uh, uh, spring pass to uh, see how it comes out with the spring pass. Okay, let's see where we're at now. So I'll pick up this one right here. Okay, so we're just a little bit over. Um, it's showing as, uh, let's see about three tenths over. And let's try this one. And here we're showing about uh, half a thousandths under. So without doing anything special, I can get within uh, a thousandth of an inch of my tolerances, but getting to tenths um, certainly would require uh, more effort. And uh, for the work that I do, I don't need to get to tenths. Less than a thousandth is good enough, so I'm pretty happy with that. So I think what you've seen from this is that this machine is definitely within my needs. It can easily hold less than a thousandth of an inch. It could probably do even better than that. Now, one of the things I haven't done, which of course I should take into account, is things like the diameter of the tool, the actual diameter of the tool, uh, check the runout of the tools, etc. Now, if I had the Renishaw probe that you can get for this machine, which is not cheap, I think it's about $5,000, not only does it probe the work that you're going to be cutting, but it can also check the tool length exactly as well as the tool diameter. And for things like uh, insert cutters like my face mill, it checks all of the, the inserts. So it'll figure out exactly how deep it's going to cut. And from my understanding, that's how you can take this to the next level of accuracy. Fortunately, I don't need that level of accuracy, so I don't have to pay the $5,000. Uh, there were other there are other things that would be really nice to have about that, but this is a hobby machine, so uh, I don't see myself getting one of those anytime soon. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please give me a thumbs up, 
comment below, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.